the economic impact of the pandemic has been reduced due to a coordinated response from governments on one hand and their fiscal stimulus and central banks on the other and their monetary stimulus. And that's been very effective. In fact, many assets have come through this crisis with very respectable returns. And you might argue that it's inflated some asset bubbles. So the question now becomes what happens when that stimulus is withdrawn? Is it going to burst some of those bubbles? Now, if you do want to learn more about investing, you can always do that by getting our free weekly market roundup. You'll find a link to that in the description below me and above me. So let's look at what happens to those bubbles when the stimulus is withdrawn in a bit more detail. This is not a recommendation. If you want advice tailored to your specific circumstances, seek independent financial advice. Let's start off by looking at what quantitative easing, or QE, means. The central process behind QE is when the central bank goes out into the open market and buys its own government bonds. So in the US, that would be the Federal Reserve going out to buy US treasuries. In the UK, it would be the Bank of England going out to buy UK gilts, for example. And there's quite a funny video by Tim Van Helsdingen on YouTube where he shows Jerome Powell just churning out the dollars on his money printer. Of course, in practice, there isn't actually money being printed, not physical money, but it is electronic money which is being added to the supply of money in a given country. So why would you do something so strange? It seems very odd that the central bank would buy its own government's bonds. To personalise it, it's as if you buy something which you've created yourself. It seems to be pointless. But the fundamental problem is about the yield curve, and in particular, the very long end of the yield curve. So this is the US yield curve as I made this video, and this gives the rate of interest that the US government has to pay on loans from one month all the way out to 30 years. And it's typically the case that the longer the government borrows, the higher the rate of interest it'll pay for that borrowing. Now the central bank will have its own policy rate, and that drives the short end of the curve. That's the bit that's beneath me here. So the yield on one month government bonds and pretty much all of the bonds out to one year will be driven by this federal funds rate in the United States. So if the central bank reduces that rate, the yield on bonds will fall almost in lockstep. But what about rates further out on the curve? Well, those aren't driven by the central bank policy rate so directly. They're also influenced by things such as inflation expectations and growth expectations. So if the central bank wants to push down these longer term rates, the ones below me here, what they have to do is buy the bonds with that maturity. And that's because a central bank has almost unlimited resources. It can literally create money out of thin air. And if it buys many of these bonds, that pushes up the bond prices and it pushes down the bond yields. And the effect, as this red arrow shows, is that that reduces the rate of interest that the government pays on debt. But you may be thinking the government can borrow cheaply anyway. Why reduce that borrowing cost even further? Well, the reason is that all borrowing costs are layered on top of these risk-free rates. So for example, if you're a company borrowing for 10 years in the corporate bond market, you'll pay the treasury yield, which is about 1.1%, plus some spread which represents your credit risk. So all of these yields will come down as the government bond yield comes down. So in theory, by making the cost of borrowing cheaper, that should stimulate the economy by making credit cheaper, both for households, because mortgages are also layered on this rate, but also companies which borrow at the risk-free rate plus a spread. The top panel here is the central bank policy rate for the Federal Reserve in the United States. And that's the central bank's way of controlling inflation. If inflation gets too high, it raises the interest rate, it takes away the punch bowl from the economy, and in theory that should slow down the economy and reduce inflation. But when there's a crisis, the first thing the central bank does is to reduce that short-term rate of borrowing. And that's called conventional monetary policy. But what we saw after the global financial crisis was this new tool called quantitative easing, 
where the Federal Reserve started to buy bonds. And in this bottom panel, you can see the size of the Fed's balance sheet in trillions of dollars. So up until about 2007, the size of the balance sheet was under $1 trillion. But as soon as the Fed started to buy government debt, you can see the size of its balance sheet increased very rapidly. And what was surprising about the Great Recession following that crisis was how long it lasted. It took a very long time for unemployment to fall to more normal levels. And every time it looked like the economy was stalling again, the Fed had to step in with another round of quantitative easing. So this was quantitative easing 2 or QE2. This was QE3 when it started to flag again. And of course, after the pandemic, we just had QE4. And the size of the Fed balance sheet now is over $7 trillion as a result. Now, if we look back over a period of about 30 years, you can see that the rate of interest paid by the US government has gradually been falling over time. And currently, it's very close to record lows. But what this also shows is that if you're a company with a BAA credit rating from Moody's, your rate of borrowing has pretty much kept in lockstep with the rate of borrowing for government bonds, plus some spread. The spread can sometimes blow out, as it did here in 2008. But once that credit spread tightened again, you can see that it moved back into that falling trend of lower borrowing costs. And again, for companies, they've never Never been able to borrow more cheaply. Now that's hugely favoured companies which are growing rapidly because they can borrow at very little cost in the corporate bond market. And sure enough, over the last decade, the companies which have done best have been growth companies, usually large tech. So the job of QE is to reduce those funding costs even more. And that makes it cheaper for households to borrow and for companies to borrow. Given the scale of these asset purchases, it's interesting to look at how effective they've been. So again, here in the top panel, we've got the Fed funds rate, and that's the rate that the central bank sets either to reduce inflation or to stimulate the economy in a crisis and to get inflation back to its 2% level. Now, in fact, one of the failures of QE was that it took a very long time for inflation to get back to that 2% level. And that was despite this huge program of money printing and a massive expansion of the money supply and the size of the Fed's balance sheet. But what QE did very effectively was to inflate equity prices. And that's what you can see here in the middle panel, which is the price of the S&P 500. And you can see that after QE1, QE2, QE3, there was a gradual increase in equity prices. And while interest rates remained pretty much at zero for a decade, that rally carried on pretty much uniformly. And in the bottom panel here, you can see the case Schiller US home price index. And after a period of speculation, which actually led to the credit crisis, that housing bubble deflated in the US. And just before QE3, you can see that there was a reversal in the direction of house prices, which had been rising steadily ever since. And in fact, with QE4, you can actually see those prices accelerating further. So although monetary policy, both conventional and unconventional, hasn't been great for increasing inflation, it's been fantastic for inflating asset prices in the equity market, in the bond market, and in the housing market. And since the whole purpose of QE is to reduce treasury yields, a lot of researchers have tried to quantify how much it's reduced those yields. The estimates for the reduction in the 10-year yield for every 10% of GDP spent by the central bank, you reduce the 10-year yield by about 0.4 to 0.9%. And if we look in the UK, the estimates are kind of similar. We're looking at about half a percent reduction in the 10-year yield. Now, the problem with monetary policy is that it's the same for everybody in a country. You can't target the poorest or the richest in society separately, and you can't target one region or another region. Everyone gets the same rates, but it doesn't affect everyone in the same way. So this graph was generated by the Resolution Foundation in the UK in a note called Quantitative Displeasing. And here we're looking at wealth inequality. And the graph is broken up into these 10 bars, where the left-hand bar underneath me here is the 10% of people who have the least wealth in the UK. And this bar beside me is the top 10% of the most wealthy people in the UK. And this looks at the average real change in net wealth as a result of QE over this period from 2006 to 2012. And what's really clear is that there's been a disproportionate increase in the wealth of the people who are already most wealthy. Why is that? Well, 
These are the people who invest most in financial assets like stocks and bonds. And as stock and bond prices have been massively increased by QE, so has the wealth of the wealthiest. We also saw that house prices have been inflated by having low interest rates and that again disproportionately favours the richest in society because they have the most property wealth. And who has the most invested in their pension? Again, it's the most wealthy. And as equity and bond prices in those pensions increased, so did the pension wealth of the richest. So this has been one of the unpleasant side effects of QE, which is that it's increased wealth inequality. But if we repeat that exercise with wages, it actually has helped the poorest in society increase their wages more than it has for the wealthy. And the reason for that is that QE has created more economic activity and therefore more jobs. So that's the employment effect here. But in terms of the effect on wages, that seems to be fairly constant across the different wealth deciles. So I think a fair criticism of QE is that it's taken a long time to get inflation back up to 2% and at the same time it's increased wealth inequality, which is a really awful side effect. Now some people have been saying that we could get another taper tantrum as the Fed stimulus is removed. What was the taper tantrum? This harks back to 2013 when Ben Bernanke, who was the Fed chairman at the time, started to hint that the Fed would cut back on its asset purchases. And it actually came in two instalments. The first one was in May 2013, when Ben Bernanke testified in front of the Joint Economic Committee. And quite reasonably at the time, Bernanke said that there were signs of stimulus working and that the economy was recovering, and that as a result, the Fed would start to reduce its rate of asset purchases. This wasn't talk about stopping asset purchases, just reducing the rate of bond purchases. But that was enough to increase Treasury yields quite significantly. So what's clear is that markets were very jumpy at the time. They knew that eventually the Fed would cut back on its stimulus, but when Bernanke actually started to talk about it, it caused a bit of a shock. The second instalment of the taper tantrum was much larger, and that happened in June at one of the Fed's Monetary Policy Committee meetings. Now, if you look back at the actual statement that Bernanke made, and of course I have, it's really hard to find anything controversial in his comments. As always, the Fed says that what they do is data dependent. They only change monetary policy when they can see that it's relevant to do so in the economic data. And what he said was that when the incoming data are broadly consistent with their forecast of a gradually healing unemployment rate, the committee expected that it would reduce the rate at which it bought treasuries and mortgage-backed securities later that year in 2013. That's hardly a shocking comment. Although he did go on to say that if things carried on improving, then they would expect to reduce the rate of purchases in measured steps until in the first half of next year, that would have been 2014, the purchases would have ended halfway through 2014. So on the face of it, a fairly innocuous Fed speak comment. But the market reaction that day was utterly brutal. These are the 10-year bond yields that day. And the dashed line here is when Bernanke was speaking at the press conference. And over the space of a few minutes, 10-year Treasury bond yields went from about 2.2% up to about 2.35%. Which may not sound like much, but that was shocking for the bond market at the time. Why did bond yields increase? Well, remember... The Fed was pushing down bond yields by buying lots of treasuries, and if it was going to take its foot off the accelerator and buy less, that would have pushed up yields. So this is yields rising in anticipation of that deceleration of the rate of purchases. And at the same time, the dollar weakened versus a basket of almost all its trade partners, again in the space of a few minutes. But this wasn't a one-day effect. In fact, if you look at the S&P 500, the equity market carried on selling off for the next four days and fell by about 5% over that period of time. Although, as you can see, it did recover again fairly quickly afterwards. But what's even more remarkable is that these innocuous comments about tapering the stimulus had effects on global asset markets, not just in the US, but everywhere. So over that four-day period, there was about a 6% fall in emerging market bonds, but also emerging market equity. Gold fell by about 5% because as interest rates rise, gold generally falls. Real estate investment trusts took a big hit, so that was about 4%. 
but small caps were also affected, high dividend stocks, and of course government bond funds, because those were affected directly by the increase in yield. So the longest duration funds sold off the most by about 3%, and short duration treasuries sold off by about 0.1%, and junk bonds and investment grade corporate bonds in the US also sold off by about 3%. And if we look across US sectors, generally the safest sectors, so that would be things like utilities, consumer staples and healthcare, sold off the least by between 2.6% and 2.9%. And the more cyclical stocks, so that would be things like materials, technology, industrials and financials, sold off more. So you can see why people are worried by this precedent given the current state of markets. Given the huge rally in tech stocks over the last decade, the S&P 500 is hugely concentrated in just a handful of names. And these could be severely impacted by something like a taper tantrum. So the take home message here is that markets hate stimulus being removed. Even though they were kind of prepared for it, and even though the Fed was very careful about its messaging, this still caused a very significant sell off, although it didn't last for very long. That's the good thing about it. But removal of stimulus needn't be a terrible thing, as long as the change in policy is slow and steady. So that was the taper tantrum, but beneath me here you can see another period when the Fed did actually start to increase interest rates. So between November 2016 and January 2019, interest rates were actually increased by 2% by the Fed. But you can see it came fairly steadily in these 0.25% increments. And the Fed held back when things got a bit scary, but then it restarted the slow process of increasing rates. And another thing to notice here, if you look at the size of the Fed balance sheet here above me, is that it was gradually decreasing over time. The reason for that is that the Fed didn't actually sell its treasuries. Of course, you wouldn't want to flood the market with treasuries and crash the market. Instead, it just stopped reinvesting the money from matured bonds and from the coupons of the bonds which it was already holding. So that as the stock of bonds gradually matured, the size of its Fed balance sheet started to shrink. So what was the effect of that gradual tightening of policy on asset markets? Well, in fact, it was pretty good for equity. So equities carried on rallying. Here you can see the S&P 500 tracker SPY, which gained about 19% over that tightening period. Small caps, usually a sign of an improving economy, rallied as well by about 14%. High dividend stocks too. And even emerging markets managed a rally of 2%. And if we look at safe havens, those actually started to sell off. So this is a typical pattern of returns you see in a risk on market. Okay, maybe it's not crazy risk on like we've seen over the past year, but it's still positive. And the reason for that is critical, which is the reason why the Fed was tightening in the first place. It was tightening because the economy was improving. Unemployment was falling economic activity was increasing, and those are all the right reasons to tighten policy. And rates were pretty low to start with, so there wasn't a huge negative effect on funding costs of gradually increasing the policy rate. And again, if we look at the sectors which did well during that tightening period, tech was one of the definite beneficiaries. It gained about 32% over that tightening period. Now, in a recent interview, Jerome Powell, Fed Chair, here seen in his kitchen, which actually got a pretty good rating on Room Rater, one that I doubt I'd get given my background. And in this interview, Powell was actually asked about the taper tantrum, and it was very clear that he's aware of the risks of messaging. He says one of the lessons of the global financial crisis is to be careful not to exit too early. Try not to talk about exit all the time because markets are listening. And he goes on to say that the economy is far from our goals. Unemployment is still quite high in the US and that the Fed remains committed to using their monetary tools until the job is well and truly done. And he talks about the precedent of the taper tantrum and how it highlights a sensitivity that markets have about the path of asset purchases. So I think it's certainly worthwhile being aware of that precedent of the taper tantrum. Markets obviously don't like it when the stimulus gets taken away, but as long as it's messaged in the right way, and there's every reason to expect Powell will do that because of his experience, everything should be okay in terms of risk assets 
and in terms of the tech rally. So I hope you found that video reassuring and helpful. And if you did, then please consider supporting us. You can now do that directly via YouTube. There should be a join button underneath this video if you're looking at it on a computer. And on a mobile, there should be a link in the description below me to allow you to support us directly. And if you do that, you'll get a nice icon next to your name so that whenever you make a comment, we'll know you're one of our supporters, both in the comments and in YouTube Lives. And as always, thank you for listening.